Hi, welcome back everyone to the Institute for Marine Research YouTube channel. Today we will be continuing on our methodology series and today we have our 3D methodology. When it comes to our 3D modeling methodology, what we're looking at is the lack of homogeny on the seafloor. That is to say, how wonky the seafloor is. The more homogeneous it is, the more the same it is across a period of space. The more wonky it is, the less homogeneous it is. Now, why is this important? The reason is that the more wonkiness you have on the seafloor, the more opportunity there is for microenvironments to form. That is to say, if you just have a giant sand patch, the only real environment there is a giant sand patch, which, while being important, doesn't create a lot of biodiversity and richness. Whereas when you have sand followed by rubble, followed by big fan corals, followed by big branchy corals, every single one of these different little microenvironments creates space for life to flourish. And that's what we're measuring. The more different environments there is, has been shown to lead to more species diversity and species richness. When it comes to measuring structural complexity, a lot of different methods have been tried. Now, structural complexity is not an easy thing to measure. The reason for this being that the seafloor, as it spreads out, tends, to, especially in coral reefs, tends to be not very homogeneous at all. And how to measure this has proven a challenge over the years. The most used method, and the one that has um, been documented all over the world, is the rope and line method. Now, while requiring some assembly, this method tends to be pretty straightforward. You put two sticks on either side of the transect, and then you put a line between the two sticks. Now, this line has to be over the tallest part of your transect. Why? Because you're going to be measuring the distance between that line and the sea floor. This will give you a contour of everything that is beneath that line. Now, this method can be changed to suit what you're trying to do. What I mean by that is the number of points and the amount of data that you take on each point changes depending on what you're doing. You could only measure depth through the whole thing, or if you wanted to move forward and do it more um, data heavy, you could write down the type of coral that is underneath, whether it's branching coral, boulder coral, etc. If you have a coral expert, which is on um, measuring the data, you could also see what gen genre of coral is underneath the line. You could additionally not just measure coral, but you could measure if it's rubble, if it's rock, etc, etc, etc. Alright, now like every method that we've talked before in our methodology series, there are pros and there are cons. Let's talk about pros first. The, easy, the first pro that you'll be able to figure out when looking at this kind of transect is that it is quite cheap. You literally need two stakes and a rope and then a measuring line. That's it. Nothing really complicated goes into it. You don't need any computers, you don't need any cameras, a slate, a pencil, and some line, and you're good to go. So this gives you the advantage of being able to do this all over the world and being able to use it for citizen science. Now, Another good thing about this is the analysis is quite fast. You only have a limited number of points across the line, which means seeing, um, comparing different transects can be quite quick. With this, though, comes the fact that um, you need little to no training. Depending on how hard you want to make the data analysis afterwards, whether you're actually considering coral genre or not, whether you're considering if a coral is based on its growth form or if it's based on just the presence or not of coral. All of this can be determined by the scientist beforehand and it'll determine how fast your data analysis can be, which it should be, again, pretty fast and it requires little to no training on the part of the person who's taking the data. But of course there are cons to this. Um, as previously mentioned, your data analysis is fast, but the reason your data analysis is fast is because the number of points is low which means the representation of your transect when it comes to the overall reef can be pretty bad. And this can lead you to gain different uh, data which is not representative of the whole coral reef and thus make decisions and analysis based on this data that don't actually apply to the reefs that you're studying. That's not great. Another thing that limits this study is that because you want to take as many points as possible to get the highest quality data, 
it takes time and it can take a lot of time. And as you know, most of these coral reef studies are done by scuba divers and they are limited by the amount of deco time that they have, depending on how deep they are, and on the amount of air in their tanks. So having this can really strangle the amount of data that you have available to you. And finally, the user bias. Even if you have two permanent stakes, when you're using a measuring line, which a measuring line, just so you guys know, is a line where at the end you have a little plum, plum being a little ball of lead or a little stick of lead at the bottom to make sure that it goes down straight. When you have a coral, which can be quite bumpy, for example, if a branching coral, and you're dropping this weight down over it, it can land on the tip for one surveyor, or it could land further down for another surveyor, giving you different results overall. And because you're only measuring one line, a change in this result one way or another could actually make significant changes in your overall data. And finally, talking about plumb lines, plumb lines do have a danger. And that is, when you're dropping a plumb line, you might end up hurting coral. Some of the branching coral, especially here in the Indo-Pacific, can be quite brittle. And when you hit them, they can snap off and break. Obviously, this will leave them exposed to disease and things like that. So you want to be really, really careful with your plumb lines. The next widely used method to see the contour of the sea floor, and thus its lack or how homogeneous it is, is bathymetric sonar. Now, bathymetric sonar is amazing. It's one of the coolest um, ways of getting information out there because it gives you a detailed view of the bottom. Now, how it works is, it sends sound waves down onto the seafloor, and then this device can measure the speed that the sound waves bounce back up, thus giving you a contour of the bottom. Now, these met, um, sonars exist from the cheaper versions, where you kind of get like just a blurry line of the bottom, to really, really high-end versions where you can get ridiculously detailed views of the ocean floor. Um, this, again, depends entirely on the price. Uh, how it normally works is it is attached to a rig, normally a boat, but it can sometimes be um, any kind of floating structure, which can then move over the area that you're trying to um, analyze, and in the end, you will have a readout of that area. Now, like all the methodologies that we've seen so far, we got our pros and cons. So, pros. As I mentioned before during the explanation, you get a lot of data points from this. A lot. The more expensive your hardware is, the more data points you can get, the more exact your measurements. And it can really give you an accurate view of what's going on down there when it comes to rugosity on the ocean floor. Now, not only this, the analysis tends to be really quick because these sonar systems, especially the more expensive ones, tend to give you immediate readouts of the ocean floor. So getting this data and then comparing it to your other data, whether it's fish, um, diversity on the ocean floor, all that kind of stuff to get a bigger picture is quite simple. So that's really cool. Um, it can also cover large areas. So bathymetric sonars can be used to plan shipping routes and stuff like that, which means that you're actually going over huge kilometer to hundreds of kilometer wide areas of ocean and mapping it out. Obviously, the bigger it is, the less exact the measurements are, the less fine scale. But, as I previously mentioned, the higher end sonars can actually go fine scale as well, which is really cool. Um, another useful thing is that there's no need for divers, so there's no need for anyone to get in the water, which might not be as fun, but um, when you are short on time and you need to do large areas, this is definitely the kind of methodology you want to use. And finally, it's got little to no user bias. It doesn't matter who's driving the boat, if they're driving the same transect, then the data is going to look very much the same. It's not going to be like the rope and line method we mentioned earlier, where really depending on one centimeter to the right or to the left, it can give you drastically different results. So that's really good. Now, let's talk about the cons. Con number one, and the most obvious one when it comes to bathymetric sonar, is it's expensive. It's an expensive piece of hardware. And normally you don't just need the, um, the sonar, you also need something that can read the sonar's results, and you need a boat and or structure to actually take the measurements with. All of this tends to add up, and it is one of the reasons why it's mostly used for commercial use and isn't really used 
for scientific use, especially when it comes to citizen science and remote operation bases. Now, um, not only is it very expensive, but also it can be limited to deeper parts of the water. This again comes from the fact that it usually is attached to a boat. So you can't really ground a ship up to areas where there's very little, um, to very little depth when it comes to coral reefs. And coral reefs, as you guys probably know, are dependent on sunlight. So they tend to grow all the way up to the tippy top of the water column. So it really limits your scope there. Now, um, the last thing is the technical know-how that is needed to work a sonar. Sometimes sonars can be easy to use, but the thing is, if a sonar breaks, then you're in trouble. Because especially if you're in a remote base, like we are here at IMR in the Philippines, it can be quite hard to find a sonar technician which can come out and rescue your operation on the moment's notice. And to have someone who can actually know how to fix a sonar on base requires a lot of training. So this is why it's usually very limited in its use in the scientific community, especially when there's not that much funds involved. The third methodology that we're going to talk about is one that if you guys are divers, especially if you've done the Dive Master course, definitely know, which is the slate and the depth gauge. How this works is you have a slate and you have a depth gauge. The depth gauge is usually someone's dive computer. And you go along a reef taking measurements of certain points as you draw a little map. So, um, as I mentioned before, dive masters actually have to do this under the PADI uh, training course. So, if you haven't done that yet, you are welcome to come to IMR and do your, yeah, that's right, selling out. Come to IMR, do your PADI training here. You will learn all about how to become a professional dive master as well as learning a bunch about all this fun science things that I'm talking about. Anyway, selling out, over. We're now talking about flat and depth gauge as used in science. And the truth is, this um, methodology isn't really widely used. And we're going to go over the reasons for that. As you know, we always do our pros and cons. But it is a very kind of on-the-fly thing that you can do if you find yourself needing data in an area and you don't have anything else with you. It can give you some semblance of what's going on. Um, Usually it can be done in teams, so you have one buddy who has the depth gauge and one buddy who has the slate, and that buddy who has the slate is also the one who's kind of choosing where the depths are going to be taken as you go along. Having a compass also helps to give you a heading so you know more or less what's going on, and you can go and you can map out a reef using contour lines to give you a rough idea of what it is that's going on down there, especially if you can use certain points as um, points of interest that you want to check out. Alright, I might have given a little bit away, but let's talk about pros and cons. Pros, again, it's cheap. It can be very easily used by anyone. Most divers already have slates and pencils, and most divers um, have to have a computer and or desk gauge in order to dive, unless you're doing something really weird in which you don't. I don't judge you. I don't know your life. But, most divers will need to have these in order to dive. So if you do, you have already have all the um, skills necessary. So, an, um, another pro of this is, of course, that you can do it in teams and it can be a fun activity. So this is something that all of you can do. There's no reason to need to have any kind of scientific objective to it. If you just want to map out your reef, it's always a fun thing to do, so to get better knowledge of it, really get familiar with it. And especially if you guys are actually in the industry working as a dive master or as an instructor, it's a good way to really getting in-depth knowledge of your local reefs. Now, let's jump straight into the cons. And the cons are, of course, that the data taken of this are extremely biased. You're the one who's choosing where you're taking the method, um, where you're taking the depth, where you're going, and how you draw the contour lines. I can absolutely guarantee you, because I've worked at dive centers before, and I've seen maps, 10, 15 different maps of the same location, and trust me, none of them look the same. They all have the same vague contours and um, different little data points, like, for example, oh, there's a shipwreck here, or oh, there's a big sponge here, but they all are quite different. And the reason for this, of course, is that there's a lot of interpretation that goes into this, and the data that you get from it can't really be used for most scientific studies. However, overall, it's a fun thing to do. So finally, we have arrived at what you've all been waiting for, which is our 3D modeling methodology. It's what the name of the video was, it's what we're going to talk about. So, 
How do we do this? Well, we have the same rig that we actually use for SVS with the two GoPros inside of their housings. Well, this same rig, we then, instead of pointing it forward, like you would have seen we did in the previous methodology, we then point it down while being two meters above the substrate. We then use a lawnmower pattern to take one long video of the entire 50 meter transect. Once we have this whole video, we then take it out of the water, put it into the computer, break it up into pictures, and then use these pictures to create a structured mesh. This mesh can then be measured by different softwares, which we can then use to get rugosity, length, and a bunch of other measurements. All right, as always, now let's go through the pros and cons so we can show you why it is that we chose this methodology. First of all, the biggest pro is the number of points. Just like bathymetric sonar, instead of getting one teeny line of points or some few, um, few selected points all over the place, you get a whole mesh of points, thousands upon tens of thousands of points actually, usually around 40,000 um, different points spread over our transect. Each one of these points is a measurement which gives you a really good view of what's actually happening down there in the reef. Um, also, you have little time underwater. That's another great pro because unlike taking one measurement at a time and having to write it down anywhere, you're just lawnmowering. Um, that's not a word. I have made it up. Lawnmowering. You're lawnmowering with your cameras. Just lawnmower patterns. So it's an S-shaped pattern where you're going down and then you're pivoting over one camera to go around. This is important because you want to get as much overlap as possible in different angles over the same coral to really give you a good mesh so you don't have any holes left over. That's important because holes in the mesh is lost data. So once the lawnmower pattern um, is finished, you can actually get really, really nice measurements from it. Uh, it doesn't actually take that much training, which is really nice because all you're really learning to do inside the water is the lawnmower pattern. You're not learning how to use a plumb line. You're not wasting any time on the water. It can be quite quick and it can be done with very little training. As long as you got your buoyancy right, you can do this. Um, and another good feature of this methodology is that if you don't want to use a 50 meter transect like we do, you can scale it way down and measure individual corals. Um, and then you can actually do really interesting things like track their growth over time or see how a disease spreads using one single coral, just photogrammetry over and over and over again which is really cool. You really have a lot to play with with this software and we feel like it can be used in a whole different variety of ways. Now, um, you can also go huge with this software. As long as the water clarity is clear enough, you can attach as many GoPros as you can to a stick and just tow it. There's actually some really, inter really interesting research going on in Thailand right now where they're doing just this. They're mapping out entire coral reefs using this methodology. So you can really mold it to whatever it is that you want. Now, as awesome as I'm making this software sound and this methodology in general, it does have its cons. The first of all is the expense. The AGSoft software is not free. We're going to put a link down to their website because one thing that you guys can do is actually try a free trial of this software. Um, and check it out for yourselves. Take a picture of some object in your house from all different angles and then make a 3D model out of it. That'll give you a really good idea of how we actually do our science. How is it that we get our results and how cool it looks. Sadly, not only the software is expensive, but the hardware can actually be quite expensive as well. What I mean by hardware is your computer. So in order to process all these 3D models, you actually need a computer that has some punch to it. Um, the specifications for what would be the best for your different methodology, depending on what kind of science you want to do with this, can be found on the software's webpage. So it will give recommendations of how much RAM you should have, what kind of video card you should have, etc, etc. To give you an idea of what we get out of these 3D models and why we believe this methodology is really the right one for what we're doing, is that it doesn't just give you surface rugosity, which is what a lot of these other methods give you when you process the data. It also gives you um, surface complexity, slope, curvature, and range. So you get actual different measurements for the reef itself. Now why is this important? It's because a lot of these measurements, when they're taken just by themselves, can be slightly misleading. What do I mean by that? Well, you can have a surface um, 
a linear rugosity that is the same for a reef that has just one big structure versus a reef that has a lot of structure along the 50 meters. But with the other measurements, this kind of stuff will pop up and you'll be able to see that, oh, okay, so it turns up this data is coming because of this and because of that. It gives you a wider, more in-depth range of the seafloor. And then we can use that data to compare it versus all the other data that we get from the other methodologies that we've been talking about. And then we can have a more complete picture of the coral reef. Now, before we go, I'm going to leave you with actually a little video of some data analysis. Again, to reiterate, we're going to leave a link to AGSoft's MetaShape down there on the description. If you really want to try it out, it's fun. You can actually make a 3D model of your cat or your computer. A lot of you guys are stuck indoors, so this is a perfect time to do something like this. Alright guys, that is it for today's video. Now, if you like these videos and want to continue seeing more of them, please press like and subscribe so we can make sure that someone's watching this stuff. Um, also, um, look forward to our other methodology videos. We still have one more coming up, which will be our impacts video. Cool. Alright, see you guys later.